All right, welcome to our first lightning review video for computer science theory, uh, summer 2022. So this video is a companion for lecture one. We're gonna be going over alphabets, strings, languages, and then the state diagrams and formal definitions for deterministic finite automata. Um, this is meant to be a companion video. So ideally you've already seen the lecture and this will be a quick review to help you out on homework or whenever else you might need a refresher of the topics we've reviewed in class. Um, for this first section, the reference is Sipser, page 13. Um, first off, an alphabet is a non-empty finite set of symbols. So examples of alphabets include 0, 1, that is the binary alphabet, you might have an alphabet like ABC that contains letters as your symbols. You could extend that to the whole Roman alphabet if you wanted to. And often, just for reference, uh, we'll use the symbols capital sigma or capital gamma to talk about alphabets. This is pure convention. They're just the letters we often use in this class to talk about alphabets. Strings. A string is a finite sequence of symbols from an alphabet. So 01101, that's a string over the binary alphabet. Um, so is 11, one one. cat is a string, cs is a string. Um, these are essentially identical to the strings you've seen when you're programming. Um, they're always going to be over some alphabet, even if we take that alphabet to just be sort of given in the background, like, oh, for 01101, one one, it's obviously gonna be the binary alphabet. Um, I guess one important thing to remember about strings is that by definition in this class, they are finite objects. They have a finite length. Um, we've got a special symbol that is epsilon and epsilon is not an alphabet character. It's just a symbol that represents the empty string. In Java or Python, you might write the empty string with two quotes. Uh, it's the string with no letters in it and uh, it's a string in every alphabet. If we have some string w, we might write bar w bar, like absolute value of a number, to mean the length of that string in characters. We might write wr to mean, that's w superscript capital R, to mean w backwards or w reversed. And if we have two strings, wx, w and x, we might just write them next to each other to indicate that we're going to concatenate those strings. That is all the characters in w immediately followed by all the characters in x. Strings are the building blocks of languages. So a language is just a set of strings. It can be infinite, but it's deceptively powerful too. Languages we'll think of as concepts and they'll be the fundamental building blocks of everything we'll do in this course. So for example, zero one star, that's the language of all binary strings, all strings over the binary alphabet. We'll see that a bunch. Um, you might also see languages defined using set notation. So if I write X in zero one to the star, that means X is a binary string. I might write a vertical slash to mean such that, and then follow it up with a condition. So all the strings X in zero, one to the star that meet this condition are in my set and in the language I'm defining. For, so for example, maybe X starts and ends with a zero. Uh, that's a perfectly well-defined language. I can also define languages in terms of ordinary English. So I could write, you know, all strings over sigma, that's an alphabet, equals A, B, C, that are palindromes, where a palindrome is a string where, which equals its own reverse. That's a perfectly well-defined language. Uh, as long as I know what a palindrome is. If you've just 
seen lecture one and watched this, you might not know what a regular expression is, but we can define languages in terms of regular expressions, which are um, ways of describing all the strings in a language. This regular expression denotes all the strings of zeros and all the strings of just ones, not the empty string. And then finally, if we have some automaton, some mathematical yes, no machine that accepts a bunch of strings and rejects a bunch of other strings, like suppose I have a mathematical automaton named D, I'll write L of D to denote the language recognized by D, all the strings that D says yes to. Um, so that'll also uh, identify a set or identify a language. Now that we've got our basic definitions, I'm going to introduce DFA state diagrams. So uh, for this bit, the reference is Sipser, pages 31 through 34. So a DFA, short for deterministic finite automaton, is a little mathematical yes, no machine. It's a machine that looks at a string, reads it in left to right, character by character, and then makes a decision. It either accepts the string or it rejects the string. So you can think about a flow chart maybe, which takes you to a yes state or a no state at the end. Uh, and there are two completely equivalent ways to represent a DFA. One is with a state diagram and the other is with a formal definition. So we'll start with the state diagram. So let's say we've got some language and our language will be the language of all strings over zero one, that is strings from the binary alphabet that start and end in zero. Uh, if you want some guidance on how to build the DFA, just given a description of a language, look at the other companion video for this lecture. Um, so let's build a DFA that recognizes all the strings in this language. We'll start with an indicator of the start state. And then we'll say, all right, um, if our first character is a zero, that's what this transition edge means. It means follow me if your first character or the next character you're reading is a zero. Uh, then we'll go over to some other state. And at this point, we've read in one and only one zero. Zero itself is a string that starts and ends in zero. It meets our condition. So I'm gonna mark this as an accept state. So a circle within an, a circle means accept. If we wind up here after we've read in the whole input, we're good. That's equivalent to the DFA saying yes. Um, while I'm in my accept state, if I keep seeing zeros, I'll stick around. I'll stay in my accept state. So if I see 10 zeros, I'll follow from state one to state two, stay in state two for a while, end up in state two and accept. However, if I see a one, um, things are not so good. Uh, I don't want to accept if my string ends in one. So I'll move myself over to another state. As long as I keep seeing ones, I'm in this other non-accepting state. But as soon as I see a zero, I am back to my good accept state. Uh, I've left out one thing, which is what I do if my string starts with a one. Uh, in that case, I will move us down here and I'll create a state that I'll call bad from which we cannot escape. As long as we're in state bad, we read in a zero or read in a one, we stay in state bad. Um, so this is our DFA. Um, let's go over how to read and check it really quick. So here's our list of double checks. So before I say, yes, this is a DFA that does what I want it to do, I've got to make sure of the following. So it's got to have a start arrow, which yes, it does. We've got a start arrow. That's this thing. Um, it's also got to have transitions from every state on every alphabet symbol. So 
So this requirement is in place so that we always know what to do. Uh, if I look over each of my four states, they all have exactly one arrow going out on zero and exactly one arrow going out on one. Um, I guess with the possible exception of this state, this zero one notation is just a simplification of having two different arrows. It's saying on a zero or on a one, do this. Um, and if I wanna make sure that my state diagram does what I think it does, I'm going to want to test it. This is the third thing I should do whenever I draw a DFA. So I'm gonna put in some input strings and um, put in some input strings and check what the output is. So for example, if I put in 0, 1, 1, 0, what happens? Well, I start here. Um, I move to my second state on a 0, third state on a 1, stay in this state on the second one, and move back on the 0. Then I end my computation. I'm in an accept state. So that's equivalent to the DFA saying, yes, you're good. Um, so yes, it accepts that. If my input is 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, I'll let you guys work that particular example. But I'm going to go from state 1, 2, to 3, back to 2, to 3, um, and then to 2. That's also an accept. On 0, 1, I'm going to go from the first state to the second state to the third state, and then end not in an accept state. That's a reject. On 1, 0, 0, I'm going to move to state bad and never get out. That's a reject. And finally, on the empty string, it's always worth testing. I will start at my start state, go nowhere, and end. So that is also a reject. So that is our rapid overview of drawing and reading state diagrams for DFAs. The last thing we're going to cover in this video is the formal definition of a DFA. So remember, a state diagram and the formal definition are exactly equivalent. They hold the same information. Um, why would we ever want to write down the formal definition? Well, because often the formal definition is convenient for proofs. It's convenient if we want to procedurally define a large DFA. Um, and believe it or not, it's sometimes less cumbersome. So the review for this section is Sipser, page 35. Uh, here, we can define a DFA as follows. So a DFA is a five tuple with the following parts. And it'll always pretty much look like this. We'll have Q, sigma, Q0, or some other symbol there, F, and little delta. Uh, and the five parts have to look like, or have to be these things in particular. The first part, Q, is a finite state set. Uh, and by the way, if you're not used to seeing giant five tuples filled with Greek letters, imagine we're specifying a data structure. That's what we're really doing here. We're specifying a lot of fields that have to be filled up with data to precisely and completely define the deterministic finite automaton, uh, the picture that we saw above. So a finite state set might look like something like Q0, Q1, Q2, Q3. It's just a list of all the states that are in our DFA. Um, capital sigma, that is our alphabet. So we need to know what symbols are legal to read in. So for example, that might be the binary zero and one. Q0 is the name of some state that's in our state set, and it's the name of the start state. That tells us where to start. F is a set of accept states. So, you know, maybe we've got a couple of accept states like Q3 and Q4. I suppose Q3 is a bad example here because 
I haven't put that in my example state set. Maybe Q3 and Q1 are accept states. Um, we could have just one accept state. We could even have no accept states. That's perfectly legal. But of course, if we have no accept states, then our DFA will reject all strings. It'll recognize the empty language. And then finally, the most complicated bit, delta is a transition function. So this is shorthand for all the arrows we drew earlier. It's going to tell us precisely what to do when we're in a certain state and we see a certain input. So we'll write that as delta is a function defined from q cross sigma to q. Again, if this notation is scary, just think of it as, hey, if you're in some state in q and you see some alphabet symbol in sigma, where do you go next? That's exactly what this is telling us. So, you know, for example, we could write delta q1 1 equals q2. And that would be specifically defining this function on one pair of inputs. If you're in state q1 and you see a 1, go to q2. Um, really, any representation that fully defines this function is fine. So if we prefer, you know, we could fully define this function using a table and say like, oh, if you're in q0 and you see a 0, go to state q0, stay where you are. If you're in state q1 and you see a 1, go to state q2. Just fill in this table with other states and other outputs for my function. So if you have these five ingredients, then you've completely formally specified your DFA. And if you're trying to prove something about a DFA, then you can say, well, let D be a DFA that has these five parts generically and start to reason about them or argue how you might manipulate them to get to some desired conclusion. So. That's all for this um, lightning review video. Thanks for watching. See you in class.